Hello, I'm Tony Guider. This is My New York. If you thought the flu was bad this season, let's review some history. A hundred years ago this spring, the Spanish flu killed more than 30,000 New Yorkers. And listen to this, 100 million people worldwide. It was the worst outbreak of disease in modern history. A new book, More Deadly Than War, explores the flu's hidden connections to World War I and reveals why the pandemic led to a revival of the Klan and passage of the amendment allowing women to vote. It is the latest book from historian Kenneth C. Davis. His fascinating tale is next. I am very pleased to welcome to the program Kenneth Davis. Nice to see you. It's a pleasure to be here, Tony. Thanks for having me. Your book is uh, extraordinary in, in graphic detail and so many other ways. But let's start with the title. Uh, this flu is called Spanish flu, but right. your book makes it pretty clear it should have been called the American flu. Well, it could have been called the American flu. It could have been the, called the Chinese flu. It could have been called the French flu. No one's actually sure where it began. But the title, More Deadly Than War, is about the connection between exactly. this tremendous catastrophe of the Spanish flu and World War I. The two things are inseparably linked. World War I, we read about it in the history books. The Spanish flu got forgotten erased. No one wanted to talk about well, it. Well, part of it is, uh, as you point out in the book, was intentional by, by leaders all over the world. It's, uh, you, you refer to it almost as fake news that uh, they kept it out of uh, the news and kept it out of history books. It's, it's very true that it was kept out of history books. It was kept out of the news at the time for a couple of reasons. The war was going on. There was censorship of the newspaper, outright censorship of the newspapers. Countries that were involved in the war were afraid of, one, creating panic, and two, they wanted to keep public morale high. And so to let people know that there was this deadly contagion racing around the world, racing across the United States, they thought it would really harm things. And so many, in many cases, they did, made deliberate choices that worsened the flu. Uh, the president, Wilson at the time, and the uh, leader of the American troops in, uh, in France, John uh, Pershing, uh, decided not to slow down the troop movements, which was helping to spread the flu. And yet this is, this is part of the reason, and there's an, another aspect of it that's really fascinating. Because we were at war with Germany, Mm -hmm. The Germans were blamed for it. That was yeah. the real fake news, that the Kaiser's U-boats were poisoning the water. It's very much equivalent to what has happened in the country today when there's a catastrophe or a disaster and we look to blame it on some foreign power or some mysterious force. Well, the fake news, as you, re as you call it, from uh, you know, b blaming the Germans, uh, it, it, was, it got to such a degree, you pointed out that uh, a composer, Leopold Stokowski, actually called or wrote to the president. Talk about that. Well, this was, uh, you know, we've seen this in our own time when we're having a problem with another country. We, want, we don't want anything to do with that country. They actually wanted to stop playing any music composed by Germans. Now that means no Bach, no, no Mozart, you know, so, so these are uh, uh, pretty extraordinary ideas. Uh, German beers had to promote, promote the fact that they were uh, German names, but they were made in America. Bayer aspirin, which was a new product, a wonder drug of the 20th century, had to put out advertisements that Bayer aspirin was made in America by Americans because it was thought even that the aspirin might be tainted by the Germans as a way of sort of chemical warfare. And of course, this is the time when chemical warfare was being used for the first time in a meaningful way with the gas uh, attacks in the trenches of World War I. Again, this has to be, you have to see what was going on in America as this flu is killing hundreds of thousands of people was going on while 
hundreds of thousands of soldiers are fighting in the trenches of Belgium and France in this deadly war. Exactly, and you point out that, uh, and why I, why I was saying at the beginning of the program it might have been called the American flu, that it, an early outbreak was at a, a military camp at, in Kansas where the soldiers were dropping like flies, but as you point out, the mobilization for war was so intense, that's nobody what, was paying attention to that. That's exactly right. The first report, real reported cases of what became called the Spanish flu, and, and we have to s mention, first of all, flu has been around for a long time. It's been identified for a long time. Thousands of years ago, it, they, uh, they, they t described what the flu was. Hippocrates, 2,400 years correct. ago. correct. They called it influenza of the heavens. The influence, and that's where the word oh. influenza comes from, the influence of the skies, because it was seasonal. They thought it's just the, the stars in the sky are bringing this. Um, so they didn't understand what a virus was yet. It hadn't been seen. Microscopes weren't powerful enough to see a virus, which is so small, smaller than a bacteria. Um, so there was a great sense of mystery about what this disease was. People knew flu, they were familiar with it. It, it killed people, typically. Sometimes there had been bad outbreaks. Typically it kills young people. Uh, I, I should say very young people, children, and very old people. This flu was striking the soldiers who were in training camps. And we have to remember, 1917, we go to war, we declare war, but nobody actually goes to fight for a whole year. They set up camps around the country for training hundreds of thousands of young American soldiers. There, were, there was no standing army at the time. There was a, a, a few hundred mm. thousand soldiers in the American army. All of a sudden, we needed a million men to go over to Europe. So they were crowded into these camps. And very early in the history of the, the, the flu, these camps became the breeding grounds for the virus. Describe the conditions, for instance, at that Kansas uh, a base. Right. This was something that they knew was different from a usual flu because first of all it was striking these very young, otherwise healthy young farm boys who should have gotten over in a, a bout of the flu in a day or two. But they were wheezing. They were coughing up uh, blood. Blood was actually flowing from their nostrils. They were drowning in their own fluids as the, as the uh, lungs filled up. They were turning blue. This is so called kyanosis, which is when you don't get enough oxygen. Um, at first they called it the purple death because the, the so many victims were, were turning blue from it. One doctor in New York said, uh, he said that they're, they're turning blue as huckleberries and dropping dead. Uh, it was a strange disease. And when I say dropping dead, that was another part of this. This was hit, and instead of being, you know, feeling lousy for a couple of days, this hit suddenly and knocked you flat on your back, and many people died within hours, if not within days, of, of contracting the flu. So doctors were mystified. Even doctors who had seen the worst kind of plagues all over the world thought this was some kind of new plague, even though it had all the earmarks of a of a, an influenza outbreak. And of course, these young men from Kansas and all the other bases in the United States pretty soon got on transport ships and went to war Again, and brought the flu with them. That's right. They were carrying their rifles and their rucksacks, but they were also carrying this vi virus. Many men who got onto those troop transports that were going from places like Boston or Philadelphia or uh, down in Georgia and heading off to the uh, port of Brest in France, which is where most of the Americans uh, disembarked, uh, they were carrying the virus. A lot of the men were sick on the way over and very soon after they landed, it's, there's no coincidence, this spreads through France into Spain. And Spain, of course, gets the blame for it, but it, was, it didn't start there. Uh, and even into Italy and then Germany to the other side of the, uh, uh, of the uh, lines where the fighting was going on. In fact, there was a, a moment when the Germans were trying to push through, a last big push, right about 100 years ago in April and March of, of 1918. And so many German soldiers were sick that the, that the offensive, was, offensive was called off. 
the German commander said, too many of my men are sick with what he called the Flanders flu, Flanders being one of the, the great right. battlefields of World War I. So there's even this sense that the flu had an impact on the actual war itself. So when, we, when I call it more deadly than war, that's what I'm talking about, this, this tremendous link between what was going on with people getting sick and what was going on with, on the battlefield. Talking with uh, historian Ken Davis about his book, More Deadly Than War, let's, let's go over some of those statistics. I mean, it's just, even today, mind-boggling, maybe even more so today. Um, killed more Americans than World War I, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam than those wars killed. All Combined. put together, that's, that's correct. And this is why, uh, again, why I call it more deadly than war. Uh, we tend to teach history about wars and generals and uh, decisions that are made on the battlefield and peace treaties. But throughout history, diseases, parasites, invisible things that we can't see have been far more deadly than war. And this was the case here. 675,000 Americans is now the estimate that died, and we're talking about in the space of about a year, maybe a little more than a year's time. That's an extraordinary number. If we multiplied that by the current population, we'd be talking about somewhere between uh, one and a half and two million people dying of the flu in about a year's time. Now, in a bad flu season, about 50,000 people a year die of the flu. So. M just imagine two million people dying from the flu, most of them young people who why, should have survived. Why was it so lethal to young people? The predominant theory is that healthy young people had really powerful, strong immune systems. And this flu, this virus was vir so virulent that the immune system attacked it so powerfully and one of the ways the immune system uh, attacks a, a virus is to send fluids into the lung to try and clear it out. Those fluids ended up literally drowning the victims in their own mucus. Uh, it's, you know, I hope we're not on breakfast time or dinner time oh, here, but yeah, it's, I it's, it's, I it's, a, it's, it's in inconceivable to us. You know, we get the flu, we get knocked back on our backs. We can there's no cure, obviously, for the flu, but we can take stuff to make us feel better. Of course, in 1918, there were very, very few remedies. So this, this idea that it was killing young people in such vast numbers and so suddenly was one of the reasons it was such a feared and, and awesome uh, catastrophe. You quote the uh, well-known science writer, <coughs> Gina Collada, who writes for the Times, um, she wrote a book about this in 1999. We probably should know more about it than we do. Uh, and you quote her on the, on the devastating uh, effects. She says in that book, each military installation struck each town, each city and remote village had its own monstrous tale of death, helplessness and social collapse. It was near social collapse. When we think about things like The Walking Dead, we were, you know, we were living through it in a sense on a, on a much smaller scale. Uh, cities like Philadelphia, Boston were hit particularly hard. They shut down all the schools, all the churches, all the bars, all the hotels, almost economically destroying the city because of, of the flu. New York City had a different response. Kept I want to go into open. New York, the, uh, I'm sorry, I want to go into the effects with uh, New York City in a minute, but I'd like to put a bow on the uh, idea of what the scientists knew at the time. You said that they thought this might be a plague. They didn't know what else to, to, to attribute it to because in 1918, uh, medical science didn't know what a virus was. That's correct. Uh, and, and so given what they thought they knew or were guessing, how did they try to treat it? Well, at that time, by that time in medical history, bacteria were understood. They had been seen. Oh, traditional microscopes mm -hmm. were strong enough to see a bacteria, but not a virus. Um, and s uh, quite a few bacterial uh, uh, problems had been solved. Uh, even things like 
you know, smallpox and syphilis had been addressed in some ways by chemical compounds, so-called magic bullets. But there was no magic bullet for this virus because they didn't know what it was. At first, they tried to treat it as if it was a bacteria, but it wasn't. So the, the treatments mm. were, were largely ineffective. Uh, again, remember, we're at a time when there's a, about all a doctor's kit had would be some aspirin. And it was becoming increasingly difficult to get aspirin because the war was going on. Right. The supplies were going there. And as I mentioned earlier, Bayer was suspicious because it was a German company. Uh, so you have a lot of combination of, of, uh, uh, of effects. Um, people would use a lot of home remedies that were particularly ineffective. The most common preventative idea, and it was used throughout the country was to wear a flu mask, a gauze mask. Which they were ineffective, largely ineffective because people didn't know how to use them properly or they would take them off sometimes and put them or they got flu infected and you would touch them and then you would touch your mouth. And so the, the masks did very little. But there are photographs and there are some included in the book of baseball games where the batter, the catcher and the umpire are sitting there and they all have masks on. Yes. And all the people in the, in the stands behind them have flu masks on. Think of going to a stadium and seeing everyone sitting in the stadium with a, a flu mask on. We see people with a flu mask now walking around New York uh, or a surgical mask. And it's still something of an oddity. Then it was required. You couldn't get on a streetcar in some places unless you had your, your flu mask on. Uh, so this was something that affected every city in the country, every small town in the country. It went into the Native American reservations. It devastated the Native Alaskan population, which had no previous experience with, with a virus of this type and was really hit hard. Devastating numbers, 80, 90 percent of the people who got sick died. New York City, uh, you go through several of the consequences here in New York City. More than 30,000 New Yorkers died, leaving uh, 21,000 children orphaned. That's one uh, of the real uh, stories of this story, is how many children were orphaned around the country. Uh, there were towns where uh, hundreds of kids became orphans or lost a parent. In those days, it was curious, I, I came across one instance where uh, fathers were not really thought to be appropriate to take care of some small children in some places. That, really? that was the thinking at the time. Uh, and so they would be farmed out to an, another relative where there was a mother as well as a father. That was just the thinking of, of the time 100 years ago. Um, so in New York, the uh, response was interesting because they started this came in waves, I should f explain that first. March and April was a, a kind of slow wave, hit in America, spread to Europe, and then flu, what we think of as flu season, kind of went away, and there was a lull. People thought it was all over. But late summer, early fall of 1918, it came back with a real vengeance. In New Apropos York, of that, you quote a New York Times headline uh, from September, September 13th of 1918. This was the Times headline, uh, you know, going to what Ken is saying about the uh, episodic nature of this. Times headline in September of uh, 1918 says, quote, New York in no danger of Spanish grip. With grip was quote. another word yeah. for the flu, a very commonly used word for the flu. But yes, the, uh, the health commissioner at the time uh, kind of laughingly said, uh, oh, well, it's, you know, it's, it's going around, but it shouldn't be too bad. Uh, a fellow should just kiss a girl through a handkerchief if he wants. That was one of the, the, the headlines, uh, the uh, subheadlines from yeah. the time. So this kind of, it's, it's not so bad, but very, very quickly, because New York is obviously a port city, a lot of uh, sailors, again, coming in and out of New York. Uh, a lot of uh, defense contractors, supplies moving back and forth between, between Europe and New York, and of course, the crowded conditions in the tenements at that time. I think you uh, say three weeks after that headline in the Times, the death toll here was 20,000. That's right. Once it hit, it hit hard and fast. Now, New York had 
even then a pretty remarkable hospital system and public health system that many other cities ac around the country. Some of the best researchers, of course, were uh, located here in New York because of the universities, because of uh, the Rockefeller uh, Foundation. Uh, New York was able to respond pretty quickly uh, and keep the death toll lower than it was in places like Philadelphia and Boston where it really raged quickly. Uh, but you have these reports of doctors in places like Bellevue Hospital saying they s would see patients twice, once when they checked them in and once when they ch signed their death certificate. This is where the doctor says there are thousands of them, they're blue as huckleberries and spitting blood. Uh, we can't even really imagine what this was like. Time after time, you hear the same description. The bodies are stacked like cordwood. Uh, whether it was an army base or a hospital uh, uh, in, in New York City, uh, the, the, the rate of death was overwhelming people. In Philadelphia, for instance, they couldn't keep up with the, the, the dead. The uh, funeral homes, the funeral parlors, the grave diggers couldn't keep up. People had to start digging their own graves. There were even cases of, of digging mass graves uh, in Philadelphia and just filling them in. So it's difficult for us today to think back because we are, we're so good at separating ourselves from death and, and keeping it and we have so many precautions in place. Thinking back to 100 years ago, it's not that long ago, obviously, in, in, in our lifetimes, when this swept across the country like a raging fire. Well, you mentioned New York City's perhaps more sophisticated medical uh, establishment system here. And, of course, we, New York had had experience with a crisis. There was a lady named Mary that, that's uh, right. <laughs> that uh, uh, caused the havoc. That's right. New York was, was familiar, and because the, the, the many of the best researchers were, were based here, uh, they understood what, what havoc could be created. You're referring, of course, to Typhoid Mary, an Irish immigrant woman right. who was serving as a cook in New York City. Several people that she worked for got uh, deathly ill from typhoid, which was a major killer of that time. Uh, they understood, of course, that typhoid came by that time was a bacteria that was in the water, usually from poor sanitation, not yes. washing hands after using the toilet. And Tony, we have to say it <laughs> because this is one of the lessons of the Spanish flu and the CDC says it right up there. Hand washing, washing, hand washing, hand washing, hand washing. Your kids, yourself, I mean, I'm not germ phobic, but I'm certainly much more cautious about washing hands, being in public places and touching doorknobs. This is the way that the flu was spread. You don't get it from wet hair or, uh, you know, uh, going out and getting a chill. You get the virus from touching the virus and introducing it into your body. I was interested in some of the um, famous uh, survivors that you list in your book? Perhaps one of the most remarkable stories is uh, the story of a young assistant uh, secretary of the Navy in uh, England at the time uh, gets sick while he's touring the battlefields. Uh, his name is Franklin D. Roosevelt. He mm -hmm. gets on a ship called the Leviathan, comes back to New York, deathly sick, is taken by ambulance when he arrives in New York to his mother's apartment on Fifth Avenue and is nursed back to health. But it was very, very touch and go for a while for Franklin D. Roosevelt. And of course, he does survive to go on to become uh, the president and seize America through, uh, through the uh, World War II. Some other survivors who, who uh, went on to contribute a little bit to our culture and our history were Walt Disney, Mary Pickford, actress Mary Pickford, Lillian Gish, Robert Frost. Robert Imagine Robert Frost. We wouldn't gets, have the all those poems. Uh, think about it. Uh, the loss. But Walt Walt Disney is perhaps a, a the name that pops up first for so many people. He was 16 years old at the time. And again, the connection to the war. What did he want to do as a 16 year old? Get into a uniform. This was, I don't know, the time of "I Want You" was on all the posters. The songs were out there. Over there. Over there. Walt Disney's two older brothers were in, one was in the army, one was in the navy, and talked about excite, how exciting it was. There were all those 
uh, recruiting posters of beautiful girls saying, I want you if you're in a uniform. So mm -hmm. Walt Disney wanted to get into a uniform. He was too young. They rejected him. He learned that the Red Cross took 17-year-olds. And even though he was still too young for that, he actually fixed his birth certificate and got into the Red Cross Ambulance Corps. But he got very sick, was sent home, nursed back to health by his mother, and eventually went to Europe and, uh, and the war was over by then. But he actually served for a time in the Red Cross Ambulance uh, mm -hmm. Service, as did Ernest Hemingway. Another, he didn't suffer from the flu. He was, of course, wounded. But his experiences in World War I as, a, as an ambulance driver are part of his history. Exactly. So, Some Imagine how history would have yeah. changed if Walt Disney and Franklin D. Roosevelt hadn't survived the Spanish flu. Some of the folks who didn't, whose names we might know, were Edmund Rostand, the playwright of Cyrano de Bergerac, um, the poet Guillaume uh, Apollinaire, the artist Egon Schiele. We have sophisticated medical uh, science in this country. You know, it has evolved exponentially since Absolutely. 1918. But the question I have to ask is, could this happen again? We are so much better prepared, better educated, better informed, more knowledgeable about viruses and contagions and infections than we were 100 years ago. Remember, 1918, there is a public health service. It was the public health service who greeted immigrants coming to Ellis Island and they would give them their health check. The public health service was small. It was primarily concerned at that time with getting doctors and nurses, again, ready mm -hmm. for the war. They needed doctors and nurses on the battlefield. So the public health service was nothing like our current CDC, Centers for uh, Disease Control. We have a CDC now that issues uh, tremendous information, very valuable information. We have vaccines that are proven to be very effective in preventing massive outbreaks of very But, I hear a but in there. Well, the but is that it's very easy to become complacent. And once again, we come to this notion of fake news. We are living in a time when there is fake news, when somebody might uh, decide to make uh, make some spurious claims about flu or vaccines or where it's coming from that might uh, really prevent people from mm -hmm. doing the right thing or put it into the context of not everyday life right now but put it into the context of a of a crisis which we were in in 1918 there was a major world war going on put the flu into the context perhaps of a 911 type incident where the nation is panicked all of a sudden. And then add to that, remember we had an anthrax scare and we were wondering where right. this is coming from. Yes, of you, course. You start to put those things together and I'm not fear mongering here. What I'm saying is that we have to be very, very careful. There are some guardrails in our country right now that are built to protect us. Those guardrails are being weakened to some degree and uh, education, science awareness, uh, medical uh, understanding, Good. prevention are all really important and we can't let our guard down. Good points all. Uh, the book is More Deadly Than War by Kenneth Davis. It's great to have you here talking about it. We should put a bow on it all by saying they still don't know the scientists what caused it. They know it was an avian flu and that's about it even at this, uh, at this late date. Thank you again. My Good pleasure, Tony. Thank great you. Great to have you here. And thank you for watching.